Do You Dance? by Lawrence Stay. Was it his imagination? He wasn't sure. There was a soft, fragile music which seemed to be carried on the breeze. After several days of wandering and climbing in this part of the country, he was beginning to feel that his surroundings were playing tricks on him. The sun appeared fiercer than he had ever seen before, and as the rays bled into the clouds, they stained the sky like a wound. The stark, bold outlines of the rocks shimmered in the light, as if they were living things waiting to crawl across the landscape. This was a strange land, almost the dark side of the moon. The lush green wand of Ireland had missed this place. He shivered, but it was not from any coldness. There they were again, pipes or whistles. He could not decide which, but the music was wound within the breeze. He stopped and listened again. Come on, you! A cry came from ahead. Sarah and Heather had gone on, their backpacks, ropes and tools bobbed like dark blots against the sparse greyness of the rocks and gorse. I'm coming, replied Robert. Hang on. The girl stopped, waiting for him to catch up. After several minutes he arrived, breathless. Heather had already opened the map and was peering into the distance, checking her coordinates. Sarah's face still seemed to mock him, her mouth upturned at the edges as though she was in possession of a secret which she would never tell. Her dark fringe blew in front of her face, through her hair, her eyes sparkled, Sarah irritated him. He had never wanted her to join him. But she was Heather's friend and wanted the experience. Heather smiled at him, her smile warm and sincere. Not far now. Hollyhock should be just over that peak. See the stream down there? She pointed in the distance. He nodded and followed her finger. That's the Hollywell. It goes through the village. See? Look at the map. He can't read maps, laughed Sarah. <laughs> That's why he belongs to a climbing club. No problem simply going up the side of the mountain. Take a run and jump, said Robert. Stop it, you two, said Heather with a sigh. Uh, come on, we'll soon be there. She folded up the map and put it into the pocket of her yellow parka. She squeezed his arm and smiled at him with her eyes. How he wished it were just the two of them. Usually it was such fun with just the two of them. The wind in their hair, the breeze blew up again. This time, a soft whistle echoed round the hillside. What about that music? said Robert. The two girls looked at him. Heather frowned. What music? Listen, said Robert, as he stood quite, quite still. The wind dropped, and there was a silence once more. I thought I heard pipes. Or maybe it was a tin whistle. I heard it earlier. I thought you did as well, and just hadn't said anything. Sarah pulled her face and went ahead. Heather 
pushed her long blonde hair around her ears and cocked her head to one side. I think I can hear it, she said after a moment. Isn't it coming from over there? She nodded in the direction they were heading. You're imagining things, Sarah called over her shoulder. It's a bit of a dump, really, said Sarah, as she bounced on the corner of the bed. I'll take this one. Robert hung his jacket on the back of the door and glanced down at the metal cot bed beneath the window. I suppose this will have to be mine, he mumbled. I'll have that if you like, said Heather. I really don't mind. I can sleep on a tree branch if necessary. Uh, no. Robert glanced up suddenly. It's all right. I'm happy in this thing. You can have the other bed. He turned to Sarah. Look, I got us a good deal with the old girl downstairs, so don't blow it. We may all have to share the same room, but it's a good size. You know, we have to be careful with our money if it's going to last the holiday. Some holiday, said Sarah. Backpacking and climbing in the wildest part of Ireland. All we seem to have done is walk. Suddenly, there was a gentle knock on the door. It was so unexpected that the three of them fell silent and stared at one another blankly. Slowly, the door was opened, and a small woman dressed in black, her hair tied into a bun, stepped into the room. Oh, I'm sorry, she said. I thought perhaps you'd all taken a stroll. Welcome. Here now, nobody's been in this room in a long time. Few travellers visit the inn, especially at this time. Here, let me open the windows for you. Air the place. Blow away the old cobwebs, eh? That's the thing. The woman opened a pair of paint-blistered frames. The inn overlooked the village square. Outside, the hum of passing people floated up to them. She tucked in the corners of the two proper beds and then turned down the sheets. On a walking holiday, you say? She said to nobody in particular. I think it's good to see young people take the air and to be able to share like this. That's a grand thing. It's so good to have you here at the time like this. Robert was about to reply when another sound, something oddly familiar, drifted past the window. It was the pipes he had heard earlier, but this time they sounded more distinct, sharper and nearer too, and this time they all heard them. What are they? he asked. The woman ignored his question. Instead, she took some towels out of a cupboard and folded them across a rail beside the small porcelain sink. Those pipes or flutes, what are they, please? said Robert again. Oh, the pipes, she laughed. Oh, oh pay, no, pay them no mind. It's a little custom we have. And you've arrived on the eve. Who's playing them? Sarah asked, as she started to unpack. And where? said Heather. They sound as though they're everywhere. The woman smiled and shook out one of the towels. Oh, they're played here and there, mostly by the older women of the town. It's a custom, like I said. Sometimes they go up on the northern hillside and sit and play. It's been going on all week. It stops after tonight. For a moment, she stood in silence and watched the three of them. It was as if she were waiting. She coughed. <coughs> <coughs> Say, young lady, do you need anything washing? Sarah 
had pulled a dirty shirt from her bag. On the back was the outline of a goat. Robert had given one to each of them. There's no need, she began. The woman took the shirt and started to sing to herself, something Irish and folksy. Suddenly, she froze and glanced at Sarah. She was unsmiling. You're a pretty young thing. Do you dance? Sarah tried to warm to the woman, but for some reason a cold sliver of unreasoned fear crept beneath her skin. N yes, yes I do, actually, said Sarah stiffly. Good, good, said the woman with a smile. It's a fine thing to dance, but we end up with the right old time. They've been making the music for her. It's all for her. She'll be there. Robert tipped his bag onto the bed. A similar shirt to Sarah's fell out. The woman saw it. My, oh my, said the woman. There's another. I'll have me a collection. It's a pretty thing here. It's our climbing club symbol, said Sarah. Before he could say anything, the woman had grabbed the shirt and held it with the other. I bet you have one too? She held Heather with a gaze of stone. Heather swallowed. N no, she said. You have so, said Sarah sharply. Heather gripped her bag. She did not know why, but she did want to give her shirt to this woman. The woman glared. You can wash mine, by all means, said Robert with a snort. All of a sudden, a surly red-faced man with mutton chop whiskers and a white apron appeared at the door. His eyes were harder than stone, and for a moment he glared at the woman. You're wanted downstairs, mother, he said. The little one's crying for you. I'm sure these folks can manage. The three of them walked through the village, and they walked together. Over the past week, they had separated amongst the hills, each climbing a favourite peak and calling to the others. But not here, not in the village high street. Is it me, said Heather, or are they watching us? Robert said nothing. Sarah remained tight-lipped too. Their mid-afternoon stroll had turned into something slightly less pleasant. Nobody was aggressive, but nobody seemed friendly either. People stood in doorways and watched in silence as they passed. Sometimes a conversation would stop mid-sentence, and an eyebrow would rise. Robert nodded politely. Have you noticed? asked Heather. Noticed what? Robert replied. It's busy. Strangely, it's very busy. And look at some of the locals. They seem so old. Robin hadn't noticed this before. But she was right. There were a lot of older looking people around. Many standing on corners, simply standing and staring. Over there, whispered Sarah, nodding in the direction of a courtyard. Look at those women. Robert and Heather followed her gaze. Beside another inn was an open courtyard. Washing lines were strung across the yard, and half a dozen women or more were hanging out clothes. Must be laundry day, said Robert. No, no, it's not right, said Heather. I got placed exactly. They stopped walking. I mean, continued Heather, there's stacks of clothes, piles of them. Look at those baskets. 
further lines of women were gathering in the square now and were hanging out shirts, trousers and skirts. As they walked on, Robert glanced down a narrow side turning. Washing lines had been run from the upper stories of the houses above the street. Women were busy hanging clothes on the lines, which were already sagging from the weight. Perhaps it's just a clean village. That old girl was keen to get her hands on her shirts, said Sarah as she popped a piece of gum into her mouth. Perhaps they all have dirty jobs. She almost laughed, but Heather did not. All of a sudden, the pipes started up again. A low wind blew through the village street. People almost stepped to one side to allow it through. But intertwined with the tuneless melody was a voice. There was no doubt this time. A cry. Almost a wail. The people around them stopped and glanced upwards as if expecting something more. The voice died with the wind as the sounds of the pipes grew louder. Then Robert noticed the women. Several crossed themselves and some kissed crucifixes which they wore around their necks. Heather tugged at Robert's sleeve. He glanced down at her and put a finger to his lips. The level of the music lowered. Unmistakably this time it came from the surrounding hills. I think I'd like to go back to the inn, said Heather. Sarah gazed beyond the hillside. As they walked back to the inn, the pipes cried out above the village. They sounded like strange birds competing somehow with themselves. Now there seemed more of them, no longer a barely pretty tune. Trills clashed against lower notes and there seemed to be no escape from the growing cacophony. Somewhere within, once again, a voice was struggling to be heard. Even Sarah seemed nervous and was uncharacteristically silent. As the three of them turned to the corner which led to the inn, they passed a small track road to the left. Here, more women carried baskets of washing, and almost with urgency, more washing lines were being stretched across the road. But what stopped Robert in his tracks was the view beyond. The road led through to a gorse patch which led up the hillside. Sitting beside a rock, a little way up was what seemed to be an old woman. She was bent almost double and was dressed in a long sackcloth robe like a monk's. It was impossible to see her face which was hidden in the hood but bunches of her hair, wild and long, stretched down in front of her. Her hair was the darkest, deepest red bony fingers were close to her face as though she were calling behind her the sun was setting the rays bled through the strands of wispy cloud-like veins for some reason robert whispered my god he looked away for a second and when he looked back she was gone Visitors, travellers, said a voice from out of nowhere. Heather spun round. In the shadows of a doorway stood a grey bearded figure. It was a man who sucked on a hooked pipe. One eye was half closed. Travellers, I said. Yes, replied Heather. Yes, that's right. He grinned. Then he added. <laughs> Do you dance? 
Sarah laughed. The music of the pipes crept from the hills again. Come on, girl, answer me a question. Do you dance? She grinned and twirled for him. This time Heather did not reply. Robert hurried them on. Something glinted in Sarah's eye. For some reason, the music had begun to appeal. The pipes continued into nightfall. Sarah tossed and tied herself up into her sheets. Heather lay awake, staring at the ceiling, saying nothing. But her fingers made a claw and dug into the bedclothes. Robert felt strangely drowsy. There were occasions when the whistling melody melted into a cry, and it grew and ascended as though it were a bird climbing and climbing into the darker, more secret parts of the sky. It was hypnotic. Heather got up and walked to the rear window. It looked out into the courtyard. The woman who had shown them to their room was joined by others. She was laying out two white shirts on a bush. But then another villager lifted a small bucket containing a dark liquid which reflected the moonlight and poured it onto the shirts. Heather narrowed her eyes. She wondered what was going on. But then she saw what had filled the bucket. Nearby, two black cocks lay on a wooden table beside what looked like a butcher's chopper. She caught her breath and looked away. Oh, what? What are they doing? She whispered. The sound of the pipes grew. I can't stand it! Why don't they shut up? yelled Sarah suddenly. She sat up and put her face in her hands. Within moments, she had bounded out of bed and crossed the room. Where, where are you going? asked Heather. Out! The bathroom! I don't know! I just need to get up! Move around! With that, she left the room, closing the door behind her. I'll see that she's all right, said Heather. The music of the pipes floated into Robert's head, but now the cries were more insistent. Perhaps there was really no music, only cries. Time passed. He was knocked from his semi-dream by a scratching noise. It was quite distinct, like nails on a board. It repeated itself, a straight, precise grating. For a moment, he wondered if there was a mouse, or worse still, perhaps, a rat in the room. Shapes appeared to flicker on the ceiling. Was there something going on outside? He looked across to the floor. The silvery beams of the moon threw a dark huddled shadow onto the polished bedroom boards. He instinctively looked up at the window above him. There was something pressed against the glass. It was only after a moment that he realized it was a face. It was huge and fierce, a woman's face with folded creases of flesh within, which were eyes that shone with a white marble blankness. Her blood-red hair billowed behind her as though she might be floating there in space. Her mouth was a dark cavern and her tongue lolled like a bloated worm. Her hands of thin, spindly fingers 
scratched down the glass. But it was her cry that drowned out everything else. It was the cry he thought he had heard before that mingled with the pipes. But this time it was a wail, a lone, a pure scream from the bottom of an abyss. Robert sat upright with a shudder which shook his bones. A coldness he had never felt before rippled through his flesh. The pipes were everywhere. Outside in the street below came the sounds of people. There were cries, whoops of joy, screams. He rolled out of his cot and looked back at the window. There was nobody there. Hesitant at first, he moved forward to peer out. Had he been dreaming, he wondered? But the scene below now occupied his thoughts. There were crowds of them, villagers. They were a mixture of young and old. But the staggering ungainly gait showed him that most of the figures were elderly, almost ancient, and they were dancing. They made a grotesque line, weaving and swaying. There was something about the way they moved which bothered him deeply. The faces glowed with a gleam of madness. Then he saw Heather. She was in the centre of the ring of villagers, which had formed close by the line of dancers. She was screaming, her hands holding the size of her face as though she was grappling with the wind. The bouncing chain of people held something like rags above their heads, waving them as if they were grotesque banners. The light of the moon glistened on the whiteness of the rags. There were marks streaks of something wet which glistened beneath the silvery rays of the moon. He swallowed hard as he realized what it was. An awful brownish red wash of color. A blonde haired girl, dowed with the same wash, led the chain. The laugh was unmistakable. It was Sarah. Robert rushed out of the room in the tap room downstairs, villagers were heaving their bones to the music of the pipes, stepping to the terrible music. They seemed not to see him as he pushed past them. It was not until he stood in the doorway the door became clearer, twisting and turning with the dancers. Like a flickering shadow was a red-haired woman. She held pieces of rags above her head, almost in triumph. It was the face at the window. He staggered back. Droplets, like generous beads of sweat, dripped from the dancers to the floor to make the pools of blood. It was almost a dance of death. Then he saw the woman from the inn. Triumphantly, she swept into the dancers and carried a shirt. It was another similar to the one the red-haired woman had held in her claws. But this time there was something about the garment which identified it. An image on the back, like the outline of a goat. She looked at him for seconds only. She gave it to the red-haired woman who tore at it with glee. With a groan, he realized who the shirts had belonged to. He cried and rushed forward, grabbing Sarah by the hand. She was somewhere else, in a grim place of reverie and her mouth was wild and open. He yanked her behind him as he forced his way through the ring and caught Heather by the waist. With tears in his eyes, he ran and ran from that place, the two girls beside him. He ran until the sound of the pipes, the cries and the screams could be heard no longer. Together they walked to the next village and arrived at sunrise, in silence. 
Later the next day, as they waited for the ferry, Robert was told the story. He heard it from an old boy, a man of the road, in exchange for a few coins. He said they should never have been in Hollyhock that night, for Hollyhock had been a community in the grip of a banshee, who once a year foretold the deaths that were due to the families there. Usually, the banshee would wash the clothes of those about to die and hang them out to dry. But the villagers now filled all the washing lines themselves with their own washing, denying the banshee. To appease the banshee, they would prepare for the dance and the music that would drown out her noise. Nobody would die that year if nobody heard her summoning cries. And if she was unable to wash their clothes. But sometimes, just sometimes, the old man had said they would let her have items of travellers, clothing if any visited their village. They would ritually bury the clothes in the earth and wash them by moonlight in the blood of two black cocks. This would transfer the foretold deaths to the unwary travellers. Then he had laughed. <laughs> it's only a story, he said. The three of them never spoke of the events. Something had happened that had placed distance between them. Heather became quieter still and rarely climbed and Robert was easily startled by the innocent flap of washing on a windy day. But Sarah continued to bear that smile, as though now she had her secret. It was not until much later that year, whilst climbing with their club on the challenging rock face, that Robert remembered and realised he had heard the cry of the thing at the window and the Banshee had handled and torn at their shirts. The accident was horrific, as Sarah and Robert plunged off the mountain face, grotesquely clawing and dancing in the wind as they fell. He heard the pipes once again.